Section 1 of The Diary of John Evelyn, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Section 1 of The Diary of John Evelyn, Volume 1. Section 1. I was born at Watton in the county of Surrey, about twenty minutes past two, in the morning being on Tuesday the 31st and last of October, 1620, after my father had been married about seven years, and that my mother had borne him three children, viz. two daughters and one son, about the 33rd year of his age, and the 23rd of my mother's. My father, named Richard, was of a sanguine complexion, mixed with a dash of collar, his hair inclining to light, which, though exceedingly thick, became hoary by the time he had attained to thirty years of age. It was somewhat curled towards the extremities. His beard, which he wore a little peaked, as the mode was, of a brownish colour, and so continued to the last, save that it was somewhat mingled with grey hairs about his cheeks, which, with his countenance, were clear and fresh coloured. His eyes extraordinary quick and piercing, an ample forehead, in some a very well composed visage and manly aspect. For the rest he was but low of stature, yet very strong. He was for his life so exact and temperate that I have heard he had never been surprised by excess, being ascetic and sparing. His wisdom was great and his judgment most acute of solid discourse, affable, humble, and in nothing affected, of a thriving, neat, silent, and methodical genius, discreetly severe, yet liberal upon all just occasions, both to his children, to strangers, and servants, a lover of hospitality, and, in brief, of a singular and Christian moderation in all his actions, not illiterate nor obscure, as, having continued justice of the peace and of the quorum, he served his country as high sheriff, being, as I take it, the last dignified with that office for Sussex and Surrey together, the same year before their separation. He was yet a studious decliner of honours and titles, being already in that esteem with his country that they could have added little to him besides their burden. He was a person of that rare conversation that, upon frequent recollection and calling to mind passages of his life and discourse, I could never charge him with the least passion or inadvertency. His estate was esteemed about four thousand pounds per annum, well wooded and full of timber. My mother's name was Eleanor, sole daughter and heiress of John Stansfield, Esquire, of an ancient and honourable family, though now extinct, in Shropshire, by his wife, Eleanor Comber, of a good and well-known house in Sussex. She was of a proper personage, of a brown complexion, her eyes and hair of a lovely black, of constitution more inclined to a religious melancholy or pious sadness, of a rare memory and most exemplary life, for economy and prudence, esteemed one of the most conspicuous in her country, which rendered her loss much deplored, both by those who knew and such as only heard of her. Thus much, in brief, touching my parents, nor was it reasonable I should speak less of them to whom I owe so much. The place of my birth was Watton, in the parish of Watton, or Blackheath, in the county of Surrey, the then mansion house of my father, left him by my grandfather, afterward and now my eldest brothers. It is situated in the most southern part of the shire, and though in a valley, yet really upon part of Leith Hill, one of the most eminent in England, for the prodigious prospect to be seen from its summit, though by few observed. It is situated in the most southern part of the shire, and though in a valley, yet really upon part of Leith Hill, one of the most eminent in England for the prodigious prospect to be seen from its summit, though by few observed. From it may be discerned twelve or thirteen counties, with part of the sea on the coast of Sussex in a serene day. The house is large and ancient, 
suitable to those hospitable times, and so sweetly environed with those delicious streams and venerable woods, as in the judgment of strangers as well as Englishmen, it may be compared to one of the most pleasant seats in the nation, and most tempting for a great person and a wanton purse to render it conspicuous. It has rising grounds, meadows, woods and water in abundance. The distance from London little more than twenty miles, and yet so securely placed as if it were one hundred. Three miles from Dorking, which serves it abundantly with provision, as well as of land and sea. Six from Guildford, twelve from Kingston. I will say nothing of the air, because the preeminence is universally given to Surrey, the soil being dry and sandy, but I should speak much of the gardens, fountains and groves that adorn it, were they not as generally known to be among the most natural and, till this later and universal luxury of the whole nation, since abounding in such expenses, the most magnificent that England afforded, and which indeed gave one of the first examples to that elegancy, since so much in vogue and followed in the managing of their waters and other elegances of that nature. Let me add, the contiguity of five or six manors, the patronage of the livings about it, and what Themistocles pronounced for none of the least advantages, the good neighbourhood, all which conspire here to render it an honourable and handsome royalty, fit for the present possessor, my worthy brother and his noble lady, whose constant liberality gives them title both to the place and the affections of all that know them. Thus with the poet, Nescio que natale solum dulcedinde cunctos, ducit et immemores non sinit esse sui. I had given me the name of my grandfather, my mother's father, who together with a sister of Sir Thomas Evelyn of Long Ditton and Mr. Comer, a near relation of my mother, were my susceptors. The solemnity, yet upon what accident I know not, unless some indisposition in me, was performed in the dining-room by Parson Hyam, the present incumbent of the parish, according to the forms prescribed by the then glorious Church of England. I was now, in regard to my mother's weakness, or rather custom of persons of quality, put to nurse to one Peter, a neighbour's wife, and tenant of a good, comely, brown, wholesome complexion, and in a most sweet place towards the hills, flanked with wood and refreshed with streams. The affection to which kind of solitude I sucked in with my very milk. It appears by a note of my father's that I sucked till 17th of January 1622, or at least I came not home before. 1623. The very first thing that I can call to memory, and from which time forward I began to observe, was this year, 1623, my youngest brother, being in his nurse's arms, who being then two days and nine months younger than myself, was the last child of my dear parents. 1624. I was not initiated into any rudiments until near four years of age, and then one friar taught us at the church porch of Watton, and I do perfectly remember the great talk and stir about Il Conde Gondomar, now ambassador from Spain, for near about this time was the match of our prince with the Infanta proposed and the effects of that comet, 1618, still working in the prodigious revolutions now beginning in Europe, especially in Germany, whose sad commotions sprang from the Bohemian's defection from the Emperor Matthias, upon which quarrel the Swedes broke in, giving umbrage to the rest of the princes, and the whole Christian world caused to deplore it, as never since enjoying perfect tranquillity. 1625. I was this year, being the first of the reign of King Charles, sent by my father to Lewis in Sussex, to be with my grandfather Stansfield, with whom I passed my childhood. This was the year in which the pestilence was so epidemical that there died in London five thousand a week, and I well remember the strict watches and examinations upon the ways as we passed 
and I was shortly after so dangerously sick of a fever that, as I have heard, the physicians despaired of me. 1626. My picture was drawn in oil by one Chanterelle, no ill painter. 1627. My grandfather Stansfield died this year, on the 5th of February. I remember perfectly the solemnity at his funeral. He was buried in the parish church of All Souls, where my grandmother, his second wife, erected him a pious monument. About this time was the consecration of the church of South Malling near Lewis by Dr. Field, Bishop of Oxford, one Mr. Coxhall preached, who was afterward minister. The building whereof was chiefly procured by my grandfather, who, having the impropriation, gave twenty pounds a year out of it to this church. I afterwards sold the impropriation. I laid one of the first stones at the building of the church. 1628 to 1630. It was not till the year 1628 that I was put to learn my Latin rudiments and to write of one Citola, a Frenchman in Lewis. I very well remember that general muster previous to the Isle of Ray's expedition, and that I was one day awakened in the morning with the news of the Duke of Buckingham being slain by that wretch Felton after our disgrace before La Rochelle. And I now took so extraordinary a fancy to drawing and designing that I could never after wean my inclinations from it, to the expense of much precious time, which might have been more advantageously employed. I was now put to school to one Mr. Potts in the cliff at Lewis, from whom, on the 7th of January, 1630, being the day after Epiphany, I went to the free school at Southover, near the town, of which one Agnes Morley had been the foundress, and now Edward Snatt was the master, under whom I remained till I was sent to the university. This year my grandmother, with whom I sojourned, being married to one Mr. Newton, a learned and most religious gentleman, we went from the cliff to dwell at his house in Southover. I do most perfectly remember the jubilee which was universally expressed for the happy birth of the Prince of Wales, 29th of May, now Charles II, our most gracious sovereign. 1631. There happened now an extraordinary dearth in England, corn bearing an excessive price, and in imitation of what I had seen my father do, I began to observe matters more punctually, which I did use to set down in a blank almanac. The Lord of Castle Haven's arraignment for many shameful exorbitances was now all the talk, and the birth of Princess Mary, afterward Princess of Orange. 21st October, 1632 My eldest sister was married to Edward Darcy, Esquire, who little deserved so excellent a person, a woman of so rare virtue. I was not present at the nuptials, but I was soon afterwards sent for into Surrey, and my father would willingly have weaned me from my fondness of my too indulgent grandmother, intending to have placed me at Eton, but not being so provident for my own benefit, and unreasonably terrified with the report of the severe discipline there, I was sent back to Lewis. Which perverseness of mine I have since a thousand times deplored, this was the first time that ever my parents had seen all their children together in prosperity. While I was now trifling at home, I saw London, where I lay one night only. The next day I dined at Beddington, where I was much delighted with the gardens and curiosities. Thence we returned to the Lady Darcy's at Sutton, thence to Watton, and on the 16th of August following, 1633, back to Lewis. 3rd November 1633. This year my father was appointed sheriff, the last, I think, who served in that honourable office for Surrey and Sussex, before they were disjoined. He had 116 servants in liveries, every one liveried in green satin doublets, 
diverse gentlemen and persons of quality waited on him in the same garb and habit, which at that time, when thirty or forty was the usual retinue of the high sheriff, was esteemed a great matter. Nor was this out of the least vanity that my father exceeded, who was one of the greatest decliners of it. But because he could not refuse the civility of his friends and relations, who voluntarily came themselves or sent in their servants. But my father was afterward most unjustly and spitefully molested by that cheering Judge Richardson for reprieving the execution of a woman to gratify my Lord of Lindsay, then Admiral. But out of this he emerged with as much honour as trouble. The King made this year his progress into Scotland and Duke James was born. 15th December 1634 My dear sister Darcy departed this life, being arrived to her twentieth year of age. In virtue advanced beyond her years, or the merit of her husband, the worst of men. She had been brought to bed the 2nd of June before, but the infant died soon after her, the 24th of December. I was therefore sent for home the second time to celebrate the obsequies of my sister, who was interred in a very honourable manner in our dormitory joining to the parish church, where now her monument stands. 1635 But my dear mother being now dangerously sick, I was on the 3rd of September following sent for to Watton whom I found so far spent that all human assistance failing, she in a most heavenly manner departed this life upon the twenty-ninth of the same month, about eight in the evening of Michaelmas Day. It was a malignant fever which took her away, about the thirty-seventh of her age and twenty-second of her marriage, to our irreparable loss and the regret of all that knew her. Certain it is that the visible cause of her indisposition proceeded from grief upon the loss of her daughter and the infant that followed it, and it is as certain that when she perceived the peril whereto its excess had engaged her, she strove to compose herself and allay it, but it was too late and she was forced to succumb. Therefore, summoning all her children then living, I shall never forget it, she expressed herself in a manner so heavenly, with instructions so pious and Christian, as made us strangely sensible of the extraordinary loss then imminent. After which, embracing every one of us, she gave to each a ring with her blessing and dismissed us. Then, taking my father by the hand, she recommended us to his care, and because she was extremely zealous for the education of my younger brother, she requested my father that he might be sent with me to Lewis, and so having importuned him that what he designed to bestow on her funeral he would rather dispose among the poor, she laboured to compose herself for the blessed change which she now expected. There was not a servant in the house whom she did not expressly send for, advise, and infinitely affect with her counsel. Thus she continued to employ her intervals, either instructing her relations or preparing of herself. Though her physicians, Dr. Meverell, Dr. Clement and Dr. Rand, had given over all hopes of her recovery, and Sir Sanders Duncombe had tried his celebrated and famous powder, yet she was many days in pairing and endured the sharpest conflicts of her sickness with admirable patience and most Christian resignation, retaining both her intellectuals and ardent affections for her dissolution to the very article of her departure. When near her dissolution, she laid her hand on every one of her children, and taking solemn leave of my father with elevated heart and eyes, she quietly expired and resigned her soul to God. Thus ended that prudent and pious woman in the flower of her age, to the inconsolable affliction of her husband, irreparable loss of her children, and universal regret of all that knew her. 
She was interred as near as might be to her daughter Darcy, the 3rd of October at night, but with no mean ceremony. It was the 3rd of the ensuing November, after my brother George was gone back to Oxford, ere I returned to Lewis, when I made way, according to instructions received of my father, for my brother Richard, who was sent the 12th after. 1636. This year being extremely dry, the pestilence much increased in London and diverse parts of England. 13th February 1637. I was especially admitted, and as I remember my other brother, into the Middle Temple London, though absent and as yet at school. There were now large contributions to the distressed Palatinates. The 10th of December my father sent a servant to bring us necessaries, and the plague beginning now to cease, on the 3rd of April 1637, I left school, where, till about the last year, I have been extremely remiss in my studies. So as I went to the university, rather out of shame of abiding longer at school than for any fitness, as by sad experience I found, which put me to relearn all that I had neglected or but perfunctorily gained. Oxford 10th May 1637 I was admitted a fellow commoner of Balliol College, Oxford, and on the 29th I was matriculated in the vestry of St Mary's, where I subscribed the articles and took the oaths. Dr Bailey, head of St John's, being vice-chancellor, afterwards bishop. It appears by letter of my father's that he was upon treaty with one Mr Bathurst, afterwards doctor and president of Trinity College, who should have been my tutor, but lest my brother's tutor, Dr Hobbes, more zealous in his life than industrious to his pupils, should receive it as an affront, and especially for that fellow commoners in Balliol were no more exempt from exercise than the meanest scholars there, my father sent me thither to one Mr George Bradshaw, no men in Visum, yet the son of an excellent father, beneficed in Surrey. I ever thought my tutor had parts enough, but as his ambition made him much suspected of the college, so his grudge to Dr Lawrence, the governor of it, whom he afterwards supplanted, took up so much of his time that he seldom or never had the opportunity to discharge his duty to his scholars. This I, perceiving, associated myself with one Mr James Thickness, then a young man of the foundation, afterward a fellow of the house, by whose learned and friendly conversation I received great advantage. At my first arrival, Dr Parkhurst was master, and after his decease, Dr Lawrence, a chaplain of His Majesty's, and Margaret Professor, succeeded, an acute and learned person. Nor do I much reproach his severity, considering that the extraordinary remissness of discipline had, till his coming, much detracted from the reputation of that college. There came in my time to the college one Nathaniel Canopios, out of Greece, from Cyril, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who, returning many years after, was made, as I understand, Bishop of Smyrna. He was the first I ever saw drink coffee, which custom came not into England till thirty years after. After I was somewhat settled there in my formalities, for then was the university exceedingly regular under the exact discipline of William Lord, Archbishop of Canterbury, then Chancellor, I added as benefactor to the library of the college these books, Extono Johannes Evlini, Huius Col Collego Socio Commensalis Filii Ricardi Evlini, e Comsurice Amig, Zantri Opera, Vols 1, 2, 3. Gnado in Tomum Aquinatum, Vols 1, 2, 3. Novarini Electa Sacra and Cressoli Anthologia Sacra, authors it seems much desired by the students of divinity there. Upon the 2nd of July, being the first Sunday of the month, 
I first received the blessed sacrament of the Lord's Supper in the college chapel, one Mr. Cooper, a fellow of the house, preaching, and at this time was the Church of England in her greatest splendour, all things decent and becoming the peace and the persons that govern. The most of the following week I spent in visiting the colleges and several rarities of the university, which do very much affect young comers. 18th July, 1637. I accompanied my eldest brother, who then quitted Oxford, into the country, and on the 9th of August went to visit my friends at Lewis, whence I returned the 12th to Watton. On the 17th of September, I received the Blessed Sacrament at Watton Church, and 23rd of October went back to Oxford. 5th November 1637. I received again the Holy Communion in our college chapel, one Prowse, a fellow, but a mad one, preaching. 9th December 1637. I offered at my first exercise in the hall, and answered my opponent, and upon the eleventh following, declaimed in the chapel before the master, fellows and scholars, according to the custom. The fifteenth after, I first of all opposed in the hall. The Christmas ensuing, being at a comedy which the gentlemen of Exeter College presented to the university, and standing, for the better advantage of seeing, upon a table in the hall, which was near to another in the dark, being constrained by the extraordinary press to quit my station, in leaping down to save myself, I dashed my right leg with such violence against the sharp edge of the other board as gave me a hurt which held me in cure till almost Easter and confined me to my study. End of section one.